It's an enormous privilege and delight to be at Wheaton. First time I've been here. Um, and um, I've had the good fortune to know a number of Wheaton graduates over the years, both as colleagues in the church and as faculty members elsewhere. And they're people whose friendship and faith in Christ I deeply uh, respect, admire, and am grateful for. So um, you're in great company as far as I'm concerned, and I'm in even better company. So uh, thanks for, for coming out this evening. I'm told that many of you are undergraduates, and you love to come to listen to theology, and that's pretty weird, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's great as far as my profession is concerned. So good. Nice to see you all. Now, I suppose one of uh, the purposes of my talk this evening is to introduce uh, some of you to what I do, um, such as it is, and the kind of work that I'm engaged in. Um, and I'm going to do that a, a little elliptically by talking about a number of different things. Academically, at least, um, in terms of publishing and so on, as um, Professor Lee said, my interests have been in the realm of ecclesiology, the, the doctrine of the church mostly, as well as in pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. These particular interests were originally spurred by my own concerns as a missionary uh, in Africa, in Burundi, uh, over a series of years in the, in the first part of the 1980s, and then as an Anglican mission priest in various marginal settings within the United States. And in doing this, I, my story is what I think is sort of a typical one, of a certain kind of disenchantment with my earlier, we'll call them naive, presuppositions. As to say, why is the church not what it claims to be? And why is the church not what it entices people to believe it to be about itself? So division rancor among members and leadership and so on. Sometimes gross complicity and violence, as in Rwanda and to a lesser extent Burundi, confusion over teaching and so on and so forth. You know the story. One of the most common things that one hears from the children of pastors, children who in adulthood have left the church, and apparently that is not that uncommon among PKs. Uh, is that they were disillusioned and even angry at seeing what congregations did to their fathers and their families and so on. And you write that on a large scale and you have a sense of what a lot of people think about the church who have been deeply engaged in it and feel somehow they were misled by what their ideals had led them at first to believe. Um, but disenchantment need not mean loss of faith, certainly not in my case. In my case, the reality of Christ Jesus' own life and divine power in his spirit has always remained visible in the church for me in certain ways, somehow. But the question was how, exactly? How is Jesus truly visible in the church which is truly his? And how do we and should we properly describe the church as it is uh, in case, uh, in fact, uh, seeming to present itself to the world? Um, the answer to the question isn't obvious. Usually it is left unaddressed, to be sure, uh, with local and personal commitments uh, taking precedence over such worrying concerns. It's a lot easier simply to just get along with business, not worry about these things if one has the luxury not to have to worry about them. But at some point, the question is hard to avoid. In fact, I believe that much of the character of the modern Christian apologetic, which has been very popular uh, in our day, and for some centuries have been driven by this question. Apologetics in general, that is to say. Um, and if nothing else, the very discipline that we call ecclesiology, this formal doctrine of the church as we call it, which by the way mostly developed, technically speaking, only in and after the 16th century, after the divisions of the church of, of the Reformation period. Um, the discipline we call today ecclesiology is at root an attempt to answer this question. At least that's how I read the history of the development of this particular discipline. That is to say, ecclesiology has really always been a form of ecclesiodicy. That is to say, a justifying of the church 
a discipline that is a peculiar Christian form of what we call theodicy, the justification of God in the face of seemingly contradictory evidence from within the world. So I'm a contributor to this discipline, ecclesiodicy, so named. Uh, although so naming it is not acceptable to all or even most people who do ecclesiology. So I've named it, and nobody else is particularly picking up, uh, taking up my name, but that, never mind. Um, from my earlier work in uh, 18th century Jansenism, which was a reform movement within the Roman Catholic Church in France mostly at the time, and its struggle and finally rejection by the church authorities of the period, even as its members tried desperately to be faithful to what they understood to be true, true doctrine in the face of, of their authorities' um, um, opposition. From that stuff, which I began to study initially in my doctoral work, uh, to my reflection on the meaning of the post-Reformation uh, discourse of division, which my book on the end of the church is about, what does it mean to talk about the church the way we end up talking about the church in the 16th, 17th centuries, and so on. And more recently to my book on the character of Christian unity in the modern world of liberal politics. In all of this, I really have had a pretty simple question. Most people only have one idea, I think, in their life. And mine is just not even an idea, it's just a question. Um, oh well. But here's the question. We proclaim the Christian church as one holy Catholic and apostolic. And if we don't use these words because of our particular Christian tradition, at least in biblical terms, we assert the truth that these words from the creed represent. So we, we, we assert this, and yet the world sees something that does not conform to this claim we make about the church. And at the same time, it is the case that Jesus Christ really is Lord and the Lord of the church, which is his body. So the question is, how do we make sense of these three claims together? These inescapable, as I view it, facts all at once. Now, I'm not sure that it's a simple answer in any way. I do not believe, for instance, that there is a kind of conceptual theory that can be propositionally articulated, uh, as once was done in scholastic handbooks, both Catholic and Protestant, when you got to the section on the church, what is it, we'll tell you, here it is, boom, 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 boom. Those answers tended to strike out some one of the claims that I've just said are inescapable, that we must hold concurrently, in my view. That is to say, traditionally, in traditional ecclesiology, one way of dealing with my question was to say, well, wait a minute, there really is no division in the church. There's only sinful heresy and schism. And heretics and schismatics are not part of the church, and therefore the church is not divided. That was one way of dealing with that question. Another way was to say uh, there really is no visible real church to contradict our claims about the church, because the church is invisible. It's not something we can see. There are the elect and so on, and uh, there is no church that the world is looking at that represents a contradiction to the church's actual claims. Or one might say that Jesus really is not Lord of the church, but he's Lord of something else, and the church is just hanging around the edges or something like that. There are lots of different ways ecclesiology has dealt with this question without actually dealing with all three parts of it. The church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. It doesn't look like that in the world, and Jesus is nonetheless the Lord of it. But holding all these claims together doesn't really compute, you see, in scholastic terms. That's been something, at least, that I think I have discovered in trying to read what people have said historically. It just doesn't compute. Indeed, one of the directions I have moved in increasingly is to locate the ecclesiological, that which we understand to be at the center of what it means to think about the church, not the church, Although that too, and with this, the whole question of ecclesiodicy, how justify the church, I've moved increasingly in the direction of locating ecclesiology in the realm of scripture reading. That is to say, to understand the church is to read scripture in a certain way. And put ontologically, you could say the Christian church is given to us in the forms of scripture's reference. Prior to, logically speaking, its historical embodiment. Scripture gives us the church even before we see the church. History is given by Scripture. Scripture is not given to us by history. 
One cannot distill the Christian church out of Scripture as if its temporal contours were different from Scripture. Rather, how the Scriptures speak of the church is in fact the church's life, historically. And I'll come to all of this in a moment. So my interest has turned to what people talk about in terms of a figural reality of ecclesial existence. That is to say, a figural reading of Scripture more broadly, which presents the church as it truly is in these terms. Now, um, basically, to understand the church, you have, to, you have to read the Scriptures and see the church in its forms. That tells us who we are. And that is a discipline. That is not a proposition. Now, this is all very abstract and, I realize, very general, and I'm going to give an example of what I mean in a moment so to put some concrete um, shape to what I've just said. Uh, but for now, let me simply say that to approach ecclesiology in the way I've just hinted at is to reframe, at least in this instance, the theological task, and more importantly, the apologetic task that has been, until the present, so central to the discipline of ecclesiology. For a scriptural, figural ecclesiology cannot tell anybody why the church should be believed. It doesn't say you've got to believe it because of this, and I'll give you a good argument for it. It does not tell us why this or that church should be followed. This one's truer, this one is less true, and so on. Um, a figural ecclesial, a scriptural ecclesiology can only say this. Here is the church and look what is happening to it. So scripture tells us. Here is the church, look what's happening to it. And at that point, having seen this, the Christian can only say, and here is what I must do. It's much like Peter's sermon in Acts 2 to the assembled people, as it were, of Israel as they gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. He gets up, and all these people are gathered, and he says, uh, this is who you are, O Israel. Here's what Joel says about it. Here's what David says about it in the Psalms. Here is Jesus. I'll tell you about him. I'm laying it all out before you, Jerusalem, Israel. What then? What's the answer? Repent and be baptized. It's not a proposition. It's a recognition, and I'll, I'll talk more about this. But Peter's sermon, as it were, is constantly being repeated in the history of the world in different ways with different scriptures and with various adjustments uh, as a result. But the framework is the same. I speak to you of Israel and of the Christ, and this is what the church is now, and hence, from this we understand our calling. That's the right order, at least as I understand it. So, let me try to go to some examples to tell you what I mean by this. Not long ago, in fact it was only uh, fall of 2012, I think, a delegation made their way to the United States and then to Canada bearing a message. There were 30 members of this delegation, mostly from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and mostly affiliated with religious and of these mostly Christian churches and groups. There were Methodist bishops, Mennonites, and so on. There were 30 of them. They all came. And they had come to urge the United Nations and then American and then Canadian leadership uh, urged them to do something. It wasn't all that specific, but just to do something to end the violence in the Eastern Congo. And they carried with them, these 30 people, a petition which had over a million signatures. And so they went to the UN and so on and so forth. Uh, now you probably know the story about the Eastern Congo, or, or, or maybe you don't, I don't know, but I'll, 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 I'll summarize it quickly. Since 1994, after the genocide in Rwanda broke out and actually came to a close immediately after that, the Eastern Congo has seen the greatest loss of human life anywhere in the world since World War II. And every year the number goes up that they're calculating. I think I last heard the figure stood somewhere between five and six million people dead. It's just astonishing when you think about it. And the violence, if not of the strategic organization that we saw in something like World War II or Soviet Union and elsewhere, you know, with railroads and camps and so on, they didn't have that. Nonetheless, these five, six million people uh, were dealt with in ways that carried the same brutality, same expressions of, 
of infernal descent, descent, you could say. Mass rapes, torture, along with obviously massacres and so on. Abductions, children who are forced to, to be deployed in, in rebel groups and so on and so forth. Well, here's my point. So this delegation comes. It's 30 people and it's million signatures. And then the delegation went. And no one paid it a bit of attention. There were no newspaper articles. There were no TV reporters. There were no magazines. You would know only about it because a few denominational websites, Catholic and Protestant, mentioned it in their list of seemingly endless daily briefings on the ethical duties that we should care about. But don't. There's one more thing. In Canada, I had to work hard to find information about it on the web. You actually have to do a good search to realize that they came. Um, now, I suppose it's hard to know what causes apathy. 20 years of war will do it. And nothing changes. That will cause apathy. Um, and among people in the West, uh, these are 20 years of war amongst people that one doesn't really have much interest in anyway. I understand that. But why cannot a coalition of churches with one million signatures, pleading signatures, these are people from mostly Eastern Congo and around there, as well as others, engaging in one of the greatest episodes of human suffering in history. Why can't that even garner a TV news story? Do you think that's odd? Now, I suppose another question to ask is, well, why should they get any attention in the first place? That's my question. For at least 16 of those 20 years of warfare, while individual pastors and priests and nuns and others have done heroic deeds of witness and sustenance, they all did it piecemeal and have been doing it. And indeed, they did so while many of their Christian colleagues did just the opposite. They traded favors with the rebels, they egged on soldiers, they paid or were paid in return for privilege and safety. Catholic and Protestant both. In the late 1990s, those who paid attention were rewarded with the spectacle of two Catholic bishops, Faustan Gabu and Emmanuel Catalico, denouncing each other in public. These are two Catholic bishops denouncing each other in public uh, because the other one was on the wrong side of the conflict. As if political sides and rival armies could possibly have been the issue amongst Christians in the churches then. And one problem was a simple one. The Rwandan government was running half of this bloodshed for political and economic reasons. And churches in the area felt bound by whatever allegiance they had come to construct to turn a blind eye in support of their friends in Rwanda. And their international brethren simply followed suit. That is one of the great tragedies of uh, something like the Anglican Church's division on this matter. The delegation who came in 2012 were, of course, breaking with this dynamic. They were openly naming the Rwandan complicity, and they were seeking negotiations to end this. But at this point, who was going to listen? In some way, it's so old hat that it probably seems silly even to talk about these sort of things. But the old hat is the apologetic question that has driven ecclesiology. Why listen to me? Why join me? What's special about my church? What's not so special about your church? And so on. Let me give you the reasons. And I'll give them systematically. I'll give them logically. I'll give them however you want them. But I'll give them. And it's a deeply pressing question in our day. Same question. In a different way. Especially in places like the United States or in more straitened circumstances, the UK or France. The church, speaking broadly, the church's relationship to wider public opinion as well as specifically legislative opinion is not just a matter of interest, but in some cases of rather profound practical consequence. Issues about marriage, issues about insurance, issues about all kinds of things. I'm not suggesting that why listen to us is the wrong question. It's a very important question. But the real question is, who is the church in America and Europe that people are going to listen to? Who in the sense of where shall we find her in the scriptures? 
that we might know ourselves and our calling. When it comes to the Eastern Congo and to the, to the traveling petition of purportedly ecumenical sister churches, perhaps, and here I'm going to give an example of what I mean by a figural scriptural ecclesiology, perhaps the church can be found in Obadiah, 10 through 15, not a place you'd normally look, maybe, maybe you should. Taken from this small, to, from this small book that is entirely devoted to a vision of, quote, what the Lord says concerning Edom. And here I turn to a simple example uh, which I will read uh, from these verses. For the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But you should not have gloated over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. You should not have boasted in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of his calamity. You should not have gloated over his disaster in the day of his calamity. You should not have looted his goods in the day of his calamity. You should not have stood at the parting of the ways to cut off his fugitives. You should not have delivered up his survivors in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Now, in this particular prophecy, Edom's sin, as Obadiah tells us, lay in standing aside as others mistreated Israel. But the depth of the sin is given in the figure of their brotherhood, Esau and Jacob. Thy brother Jacob is said several times here to Edom. Thy brother Jacob. And that's the object of this relational failure. Violence, standing on the other side, looking away, gloating as your brother became a stranger. Following in after Jacob's enemies have broken down her gates and picking up the leftover spoils, even standing at the crossroads and blocking the way of Jacob's escape. And thus, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Now this figure of these two brothers obviously goes deep in the Bible, doesn't it? All the way back to the story of their birth that's given in Genesis, uh, that we all know well. And then the account afterwards, after they're grown up, of their struggles and tensions and so on with Jacob taking Esau's place as the firstborn, and then stealing quite literally their, father's, their father Isaac's blessing. The relationship between the two is, is obviously very complicated, you can imagine. It's filled with enmity and menace, as it's retold, uh, anxiety, but also forgiveness and reconciliation, to the point where Jacob himself offers his displaced brother a blessing of his own come back to from Genesis 33, even while Esau enjoys a subsequent blessing from his father Isaac that will place him somehow above his brother at some point. So Esau and Jacob a long and tortured story. And as part of this story, because it's told in Genesis, in part I think for just these reasons, as the genealogies that follow tell us, and we all know the subsequent history between the uh, peoples of Edom and so on, Edom's descendants and, and the book of, of Israel, uh, the people of Israel, um, the prophets are filled, as we know, with all these divine denunciations and curses against the Edomites, often couched in eschatological tones. And of course it's Paul who uses the figure of the two brothers in Romans, right, to express the stark mystery of God's choices. In this case, the choice of wicked Jacob over the firstborn Esau. Quoting Malachi, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And when Malachi says it, it is God's answer to the complaining Israelites, love for whom God asserts despite Edom's present prosperity. For Paul, it's a sign of God's choice of the younger over the older, of the Gentiles in Christ over the Jews in the flesh, and so on. And in each instance, it is the case 
that this is who Israel is in relation to the nations and who this particular nation is in relation to Israel. Jacob and Esau are something insofar as they are described the way they're described in Scripture. They represent, they are something real. Now let's just go on with this particular figure. Augustine, uh, not without reason, will take Paul's figure of Romans 9 and so on, uh, mostly as an image of election and predestination to salvation more broadly. That's what he's interested in, in using this particular image. And the larger tradition in the Middle Ages and even beyond will still focus nonetheless on Esau as being part of the nations. And it will go back and forth as to who is who. Who is Esau? What nation does Esau stand as? For the Jewish exegetical tradition, who is Esau? The Christians. <laughs> That's pretty obvious. Christians are the ones who've done all this stuff, gloated over us and ruined our lives and run in and, and despoiled us and so on. Um, lifted high today, but yeah, when the Messiah comes, brought down low. Uh, for the Christians, obviously, though, as the tradition develops, Esau symbolizes the Jewish synagogue, exalted in the past, but now, as we can see, brought low. Um, in, 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 it's a famous, there's a famous uh, sort of encyclopedia of types and allegories published in the 16th century by a man named Geronimo, I like that name, Geronimo uh, Lloret, a Spanish person, much, much, uh, republished many times and just lists all the different ways you can look at every single figure in the Bible and so you come to Esau what does Esau stand for the Jews yes uh, the, the carnal view of the law the flesh the bestial man hypocrisy evil human passions and all heresies of any kind that's who Esau is and Philo the Jew is used as an authority to make sure this is uh, understood to be the case. Um, and uh, not until recently, mo modernity, with people like uh, William Blake, the poet, is there any attempt to break up this opposition of Christian and Jew as the figures, one way or the other, of Esau and Jacob. Uh, of course, he creates his own new opposition. Uh, it's organized religion denounced over and against enlightened and uh, embattled spirit, so he has a new way of, of understanding it. By the way, uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but the whole, what we call the history of interpretation, um, sometimes reception history of the Bible, very important in the kind of thing I'm talking about, uh, but not because it's historically interesting, which it is, but in the sense of the German theologian who first sort of coined this uh, term, Wirkungsgeschichte, Ebeling, which means history of effects. The Bible actually does things in the history of the world. And so when we read the interpretations of the Bible in the history of the world, we can see what the Bible is doing to people. It's a way of sort of uh, having a lens as to the power of the word in shaping, for good or ill, in judgment and mercy, the people who read it. So anyway, that's, that's part of this. In any case, back to Obadiah. I think what Obadiah presses us into engaging is price, precisely what Genesis uh, is insisting on as well. That is to say, Jacob and Esau are brothers. Your brother, he tells Edom. And the history of their relationship is made profoundly problematic precisely because they are brothers. At the core of their relationship is their rivalry. Somebody like Rene Girard would, would find very interesting, except interestingly enough he's not interested in this particular story, but he could be. Um, uh, the jealousies the submerged and uh, frightened angers, the desperate losses, and so on, and most deeply, the betrayal that this brings with its incomprehensible violence years later as Israel is given over to Assyria and Babylon. You stood aside. You blocked my way of escape. You took advantage of my misfortune. You laughed. And yes, there's also the pathetic historical figure making use of the biblical figure in which Jew and Christian for centuries apply the figure contradictorily to one another. Your Edom. <laughs> no, 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 no. Your Edom. Who is Edom? Who is Esau? Precisely, I think, 
in order unwittingly to prove the scriptural figure right. And I think it's there you see that Paul's mysterious deployment of the brothers is actually displayed in its shocking meaning. God chooses in the midst of our own perverted choices. Neither one of us deserves anything. Yet God makes a choice in some way which is utterly, utterly mysterious. I think, in fact, that the Jewish-Christian heretical disjunction is paradigmatic for Christian division itself, as I've suggested in my recent book. As the Jew became the Christian church's primordial heretic, that is how the early Christians uh, eventually began to place them in their heresiologies and so on, their little lists of heresies and so on, the Jew was the primordial heretic who stood for all other heresies. Um, as a definitional identity. It provided a ground upon which brother, you see, could also become heretic as a kind of definitional identity. Edom, Esau, you see, the Jew, becomes Judas, lurking about on the corners of the church and then breaking forth from time to time and going out and forming new conventicles. That's how it became to be uh, said over and over again in the church's retelling of this story. But given something like Obadiah, which I read a moment ago, I think it's better to see the Jewish Christian brother-brother division as a figure of the church. The church. The church herself. Brothers become the brothers of the Lord. Brothers in the Lord. That's their calling, certainly. It's also the judgment continually brought upon their unresolved Christians, that is to say, their unresolved and frequently hostile relationships. Obadiah is talking in part about you and me, not about Jew and Christian or Edom and Israelite only. Now that's a very quick and a very simplistic reading of Obadiah 10 to 15, but it represents a thumbnail sketch of a figural ecclesiology in action. Fairly straightforward. Why don't they listen to the delegation from Eastern Congo? Because Esau and Jacob together have met their common Babylon, who is, after all, just that to all the sons of Isaac. If one were to look around, Obadiah's denunciation would seem apposite enough, I think. On just a few recent visits of my own around the world, what is there to see? Well, in Burundi, after their long 13-year civil war, after the hard slogging of a few churches that could weather the violence, we see the flooding of the country with new and shiny denominations aimed at capitalizing on the depletion of the weary faithful. Or in Tanzania, American Eastern Orthodox trying their hand at nudging out the Catholics and Protestants in the central part of the country. Or Protestants doing the same in this or that place, Russia, I don't know what you want to say. Catholics and Protestants toting up scandals of the other, whose abuse is really worse in the eyes of the, of the, of the uh, media and so on, whose embarrassment. It's a little bit like the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, you may recall. On that day, 40,000 people were killed in an earthquake and tsunami that followed. 40,000, 1755. The, the news quickly spread around Europe and people were aghast. The government of England called for a day of fasting in the wake of, of such, a, such a tremendous uh, loss and sudden loss of light. However, however, uh, there were many Protestants who happily noted that God's judgment on the thousands of dead and injured took place on a day that was clearly repellent to the deity. After all, it was All Saints Sunday and they were praying to the saints. What would you expect? And then, you see, in our own world, in my own world of, of Anglicanism, it sort of schadenfreude uh, run amok, you know. Uh, everybody is looking at the other's fall. Esau and Jacob eyeing each other and one trying to sneak in on the other. Now there's an odd aspect to the Old Testament judgments against the nations. Israel's being punished, that's very clear, in all these many things. Uh, God leaves no doubt about that. But that's not your business, Edom. <laughs> that's not your business, Moab. 
Ammon, the rest of you. That's not your business. You can be judged for how you treat Israel, even though God is the ultimate agent of Israel's suffering, and Israel the cause of her own demise through her sin and unfaithfulness. Just because Israel is wicked, and let us say, just because the church is wicked, and can be wicked, and can be wrong, there is no excuse for your own wickedness towards her. Now this is what this is what is said over and over again by the prophets with respect to the nations over and against Israel. So in the end, the prophetic, prophetic denunciations of the nations that we tend to skim over, because they're really long, they do have a point, at least this point. All are guilty. Israel and the nations fall into the same pit, as it were. Esau and Jacob are caught up in the same dynamic of judgment. And this allness that is being, you know, uh, uh, rammed and pressed upon us over and over as we read through Jeremiah and Nahum and so on and so forth. Um, this allness is something that is brought into relief, obviously, by Paul and by Jesus himself, New Testament more broadly. This allness is one of the reasons why the figural reading of the scripture with respect to the church is properly <laughs> inclusive, I think, of multiple texts and reference. The church is Israel. Yes, but the church is also Edom. And it's also Ethiopia. And it's also Nineveh. And it's also Moab. We are to find the church there in all these places in Scripture. Now given this allness, the division of the church is both easily engaged by Scripture, but it's also very subversive of all sorts of ecclesiodicies the same time. How can we justify the church with precision if our very being is tied up with a history of unjustifiable figures? That's hard. How do I say this church is Israel and this church is Edom? When in fact, when I look at scripture, they keep changing places in some kind of funny way. Um, which is why the apologetic use of ecclesiology has little place in the kind of thing I'm presenting. We're not listened to. That's pretty clear. But that's only because of who we are. We're not listened to because of who we are. And that's not a strategic problem. As if we could make better arguments or organize better petitions, get better publicity, and have a better profile in our advocacy groups. And then if we did that, then people would pay attention to us when we went to the UN. If we're not listened to, at least according to this way of looking at ecclesiology, it is because of a condition before God that we are in. That, that's simple. And this is a theological problem in a technical sense. But even more so, it's an exegetical problem in the sense of trying to understand what it means that such and such is happening and in this what is happening to the church given who she is. And for me, it is where my work has taken me and driven, uh, driven now by this question. Is the church, such as she is, given a place in history that we can understand scripturally? That's what I'm interested in. Is the church, given who she is, something that can be understood scripturally? And though it's a simple question in a way, it's not necessarily one that is asked in these terms as a matter of course, certainly not in academic journals. I've been told more than once at job interviews uh, talking about some of these interests, but this isn't theology. This is preaching. Or what, you, what, what is this? It sounds like Darby or something, you know, uh, 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 sort of ersatz prophecy or something like that. Um, but actually it's a question with a long history in the theological tradition. Uh, through from the early fathers, through people like Salvian and, and Bede, then through the Middle Ages, winding its way into the corners of both Protestant and Catholic theological uh, reflection. Puritans, Jansenists, Jesuits, even Anglicans have all asked this question at different times and in different ways. Uh, part of retrieving this tradition I think is an important one. And it's one I've spent a little bit of time on, um, although I haven't gotten very far. 
Modern theologians, though drawing on elements of scholastic disdain, want to siphon off this kind of reflection, as I said, as sort of being bound to some kind of prophetic genre that has no place in serious academic discussion. But I would counsel resisting such a temptation. We know the church in her scriptural identity. That is a theological claim. We know the church in her scriptural identity. The Israel of God, that's who the church is, the Israel of God bound up with the body of Christ. We describe the church, her history, her division, her growth, her shrinkage, her challenges, martyrdoms, glory, whatever. And we see in what ways this scriptural identity is described as somehow inclusive of the way we see the church and understand her to be today. Hence, we learn of God. That's theology. That is a learning about who God is. If there is a prophetic aspect of this kind of theology, it's certainly not of a predictive kind. Uh, but rather, it's the unveiling of the present. As Pilate says, ecce homo, behold the man, behold the church. Uh, how, is, uh, how we see this, of course, is, 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 is something that is part of the theological challenge. In terms of method, this kind of discipline falls into the category of what some people call theological phenomenology, which is a nice big word, which simply means that theologically you describe the world as it is, as deeply and as fully as you can, and of course what makes that theological is precisely the fact that you place it all within the context of the scriptural uh, uh, narrative truth itself. That is the point that draws both the theological and the moral together insofar as the two are integrated in the scriptural. Now the problem with phenomenologies, descriptive things, is they don't seem to offer very many clear directives for action. And of course modern theology has been so long fueled by an activist fire as the apologetic impulse of ecclesiology has demonstrated. What is the true church? If I can figure that out, then I know what to do and I can tell you what to do. And that's a very activist way of understanding what the purpose of this is. And theological phenomenology describing the scriptural church in this case can't fulfill that impulse. Uh, but I think the worry about uselessness nonetheless should be um, uh, avoided. To see the church to use this example that I've just used in her scriptural place is also, as I indicated, to see the people of the church in the place where they are properly addressed by God. So in other words, to see the church clearly is to be able to hear God. And you can't hear God until you see what the church really is because you're not hearing openly in some fashion. A divided church is properly called to repentance, as I have long argued. That is who we are from a purely descriptive perspective, I would argue. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, convertere ad dominum deum tuum, in the famous words of Lamentations. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, turn, repent to the Lord your God. Um, and those are famous phrases taken up in the tenebrae services that the Catholic tradition has used in Holy Week. By the same token, that repentance is given in acts that themselves embody the redemptive grace of Christ given just there, such that repentance is promised to be renewal. That's the activist part. You don't know what it means until you repent. There's no way to know what the activist outcome, if you will, of, of, of God's call could possibly be until one has actually come to the place where one's conversion, in this case of the church, has actually, in some sense, happened. Uh, that's why it's utterly non-strategic, I understand. Um, the burden of my last book, in part, was to point out that the unity of the church that we so long for is given supremely in the act of Jesus' own self-giving to his enemies. That's what unity is. Jesus, the perfect penitent. Um, as many people spoke of, including C.S. Lewis. And this is where we find him in our repentance. In such acts as these, we find Jesus, the one who unites us. And these acts are visible. That's the point. I'm not talking about something that's just cerebral or devotional. They're visible, and you can describe them as such. And history is full of them as such, even though they're non-strategically given. Acts of unity that in their simplicity of self-giving to brothers, Jacob sharing with Esau in the figure uh, I've been discussing from the scripture, establishes a new future. 
So these words from Genesis 33. Jacob said to Esau, this is after the whole long thing, you know, and he runs away and he comes back and he's scared and he prays and he wrestles and he does this and that. He sends his, he sends his, his family ahead of him because he's afraid Esau's going to gonna, um, get him in the neck. Jacob said to Esau, he goes to see him, if I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For truly to see your face is like seeing the face of God. With such favor have you received me. Except I pray you my gift that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. Thus Jacob urged Esau, and Esau took the gift. To me, those are one of the most hopeful verses, at least in this particular ecclesiological context, one of the most hopeful verses in all of Scripture. Luminous, in a way. Now, there are numerous places of such unity, many of them heroic and heartrending, which you can read about in books and, and so on and so forth. But let me mention one that is very mundane. Some of you may know of the remarkable Russian Orthodox seed and blooming flower that was planted in Paris following the Bolshevik Revolution and the increasing persecution of the Orthodox Church by the Soviets, right? Uh, the Parisian Orthodox emigre community and its seminary of St. Sergius gave us thinkers like Bulgakov, Lasky, Florovsky, Schmemann, Meindorf, and others, some of whom then went to the United States and set, set up St. Vladimir Seminary. And it's now a very vibrant press that we all benefit from. But who knows how this happened? I read a book recently, I mean, I knew a little of this, but I didn't really know the details by... Uh, Matthew Lee Miller, called The American YMCA and Russian Culture, The Preservation and Expansion of Orthodox Christianity 1900 to 1940. Just came out last year. It fills in this whole story. Um, in brief, the YMCA, which had begun work in Russia before the revolution, and in doing so discovered a kind of culture shock it hadn't imagined it was going to face, you know, they were trying to set up youth groups and basket. I don't know, they didn't have basketball then, but that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, and here are these Russian Orthodox youth. And they, they didn't know what was going on. But they, they tried, and they did their best. Uh, but then um, uh, they became the key partner of the Russian Orthodox who fled the Soviets, or the Bolsheviks, and then the Soviets after them, uh, and helped them relocate. That's what they ended up doing. To people like the Methodist hero of the 1910 Edinburgh Missionary Conference, John Mott, and others, the YMCA saw that Russian Orthodox theologians, intellectuals, and others, priests, were moved. They bought books for them. They bought them a seminary and set it up. St. Sergius, later, they were, they were key in setting up St. Vladimir's. Um, and theological treatises by these people like Bulgakov and so on were published in Russian by the YMCA press in France and then sent back to Russia and other places to be disseminated secretly uh, within Russia. And in doing so, evangelical American Christianity, and the YMCA was still evangelical in those days, though it may not be anymore, um, in doing so, evangelical American Christianity and Russian Orthodox perspectives came to a an amazing uh, relationship of some kind, astonishing. You know, not, not so much that some new theology came out of it, although who knows in some way, but Christian life itself was altered. And we, we actually see some of the fruit of it. Probably no more magnificent testimony uh, to what became the tatters of the ecumenical movement in our day than something like this in the 20s and 30s and, and so on. But it was quiet. It was unheralded. And today, mostly, frankly, forgotten uh, in an America where Christian rivalries continue to mark our condition in the veiling of our words and deeds. Um, but my point being that if one can think in these kinds of terms and similar kinds of terms, one is indeed talking about uh, an ecclesial uh, repentance that indeed fulfills precisely some of the figures, if you will, that we see in Scripture about this. Now, I'm a theologian, despite what some people think. Um, but I do think that theology has done a great 
disservice to the church at times. It has obscured often the, the, the theological or the moral doctrinal nexus of ecclesial witness. Um, we, we laugh at the, at the sort of odium theologicum, you know that term? That, that, that refers to the fact that of all people, of all, all disciplines, theologians are the most nasty people when they get into arguments with one another as anybody else. That's the, theolog uh, the odium theologicum. And there's some truth to that. Uh, we laugh at it, but it actually, there's some tr there is some truth to it. Absolutely. You can't pull the doctrinal and moral apart. Um, in, in something like the Donatist controversy, one sees Augustine struggle with this, and with all the right instincts, it seems to me. Uh, he, he realizes these two have to get together, but it gets too hard, especially as life in North Africa degenerates. Uh, and you know, in ways that are maybe not all that unlike the Eastern Congo in a very different way. Donatists, Circumcellians, the Catholics, then the Arians, and they all come in and North Africa becomes what it became. And later on you'll have somebody like Machiavelli who's writing about this say, well, who in the world was anybody praying to at that time? They all seem to have different ideas about, you know, who they should be calling upon to fix everything. Um, it was sort of a de facto polytheism, he says. Uh, instead, the theological point taken from it all was this. Uh, how find the right church in the midst of a smorgasbord of churches and to press its purpose? And that's how church history has been written. And the flip side, of course, is Machiavelli, who says, who cares? Why should I care about this? And it is the path that theological inquiry has tended to follow. So, in summary, I, I, I suggest a different kind of ecclesiology. It's one that measures the church, defines it according to the form it takes in the world's eyes. That's something important to do and necessary. That's not a question of publicity, necessarily, or conversions, but simply of the set of the church's shape in comparison with the nations, as it were. What we look like together to other people. That is an essential aspect. And theologically, the look of the church is given in its focus, finally, through its scriptural form. Having been able to de define and describe the church as it appears in the world, we look for it in the scriptures. We search the scriptures to find the church that we are. Such an ecclesiology appropriately should give rise to prayer. And it gives rise to gauging the place of our faithfulness. And it gives rise, of course, to repentance, which then becomes, God willing, the noticeable thing, if you will. And from the world's perspective, noticeable sub contraria in the oddest and most hidden of ways. As Jesus says, it is the place where the Father, which is in secret, seeth in secret. And thence our views of the church will lead us into such faithfulness as this. Thank you. I'd be the first person to say that the Episcopal Church in the United States as an organizational entity is deeply disturbed in certain ways. So I would see it as, you know, Jacob in the same place that, that uh, Obadiah sees Jacob or assumes Jacob to be. But I also see a lot of what one sees in Jacob. I see the genealogies of faith. I see the fathers and mothers of our faith. Uh, who are part of that network that gives us uh, the genealogy of Jesus, of Mary, uh, of Joseph, of others. And that's what I love about the Episcopal Church, is that um, we are bound together because God has placed us together, and through that together, uh, the, the, that blood, literally, which is Christ's blood, we, we have... Uh, 
we have been given the grace of love, whether we use it or not, uh, and of, 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 of bearing witness, hopefully truthfully, in the midst of that. Um, I don't know that one. It's like somebody saying, you know, well, you're a kid. Surely everybody went over to somebody's house and said, boy, I wish I lived in this state. And, uh, you know, I don't know, they let you stay up late, or they had nachos every night, or whatever <laughs> it was. Everything was really cool over there, and your family, they made you go to bed on time, and you couldn't have nachos. <laughs> but as you, and as you get older, some of that isn't, isn't that isn't so nice. I mean, it wasn't just you didn't have nachos. Maybe you got hit. Maybe you got something worse than that in your family. But I think most people know that their family is their family. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that churches are families over and against other families. Uh, not at all. And yet, our, our, it, the reality of that aspect of family life is given where we are, where we are placed in the church, period, wherever that might be. And I don't think it, that one can simply say, I'm going to change my family, um, speaking in terms of Christ. Now, one can and one does and one has to sometimes. Um, child services. Um, whatever, the ecclesial, <laughs> the ecclesial uh, uh, simile would be. So. Yes, sir. Thanks for the lecture very much. And, um, I'm very, very much sympathetic to what you say when you say that um, a divided church is a church in need of repentance. I was wondering if you could give greater clarity on what the sin is that a divided church needs to repent of. Part of why I'm asking this is that for some, uh, their division is actually a matter of integrity for Christ. Um, I think Martin Luther in particular, he's standing on the scriptures and he feels that he, you know, he's working towards unity, but when that fails, he, he must stand with the true gospel. And so there's this division, but it's a division that is based on his integrity before God. Um, for many Protestants, our stance, where we are, where, what our tradition is, um, is a result of our integrity for God in the scripture, what we hold to be true over against other expressions of Christianity. Help me understand what repentance looks like. What is it we're repenting of? How does, what is our sin? Well, I'll use a story I use at the end of my recent book, which is not my story, it's, I heard it from Rowan Williams, who talks about desert, some story of the Desert Fathers, where they're all there, and, and there's a monk who's been disobedient and, and sinful, and uh, he has to be disciplined and sent away. And they go through the whole thing, and they discipline him, and they send him away, quite rightly, because he has, he has failed in his faith. And then the Abba walks out behind him, the door, and follows him, and goes with him. Um, so the issue isn't who's wrong, uh, and, and what the issue of faith is. In this case, uh, the monk needed to be disciplined, and was disciplined appropriately. Uh, on the other hand, the church follows the sinner, and doesn't simply let the sinner be who they are. That's, that's, that would be, in some sense, the character of a repentant, uh, well, actually, diff that's different. That would be a sort of pre-repentant, but it would be appropriately repentant, because then why does, the, why does the, the, the Abba do it? Because he knows on some level, more than one reason. On one level, he knows he's the same sinner, maybe for different reasons, but he's the same person before God as this other person is. Um, that's number one. The other is he loves. He loves the monk utterly and uh, is willing to bear the burden of that monk's uh, somehow punishment in and of itself. Um, now, how do churches do? What would Luther do? I mean, and the, 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 you, you properly give them. And this is the big question, right? This is the, the 64th. Why was it $64,000? Was there a show or something? $64,000 question. Um, because everybody has a point in which they say, I mu my conscience tells me I must do this. Now, the problem, of course, is everybody's conscience is different. That is, that is a reality in the church. Erasmus had a conscience, too. And I don't know that his conscience was any worse than Luther's. It was different. I'm not being relativistic about this. 
Uh, one was righter than the other about X, Y, and Z. I'm quite sure of that. But, but the place where division happens is where one loses a sense that before God, one is not worth any more than the other person. And that the love one has and is called in and, and given in Christ is the same for that other person as for me. And that somehow I have to figure out a way to live that. Now, how one does that is that in the Reformation is a complicated thing. It wasn't that Luther was just being stubborn, although he was being stubborn in lots of ways. And it wasn't that the Catholic Church was really just making a few minor mistakes. And um, why couldn't Luther just sort of uh, you know, be a little more patient and things would get sorted out eventually? Um, no, I mean, these were huge, huge issues. And um, that's one reason, though, you see why, as I said, I don't think this is strategic. This isn't a matter of figuring out that Whenever X happens, I'm, I'm supposed to do Y. This is, living, this is living the life God has given us in the scriptures. And sometimes that's going to be our own judgment. We're not going to realize that until afterwards, furthermore. I mean, when Israel is shorn in two, God is doing that in part. You know, Jeroboam and all that. That's not, it's not like, you know, Israel didn't deserve it. They deserved it. Of course, it didn't help Jeroboam. He shouldn't have done it. <laughs> he was supposed to do it, but he shouldn't have. I mean, we see all this. And... It's this funny place. So that's why I say this isn't about figuring out, giving my list of, of, of a to-do list. It's finding out who we are in the scriptures now and understanding that, then being able to live somehow in a responsive way. Um, and it is a different way of thinking because it's not the way one, uh, it requires, a, as I said, it's a discipline. It's not a, it's not a logic. Um, I'm not really answering exactly, but I'm doing my best. Uh, in what is a very difficult question, which goes to the heart of this very difficult sort of um, um, challenge of our churches. Um, yeah, Mike. Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. If we could, um, kind of going off that point, um, maybe talk less about um, maybe doctrinal division and talk, um, I'd be interested in seeing how your figure of ecclesiology would apply to racial or ethnic division, um, particularly in the United States, um, and how maybe reconciliation um, could still follow this model of, of um, Jacob and Esau, uh, or just what your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, that's, a good, that's a good question and a big one. One of the, one of the places I, I, in my string of failed ministries, one of them was in an inner city parish in uh, mission in Cle East Cleveland, which um, was meant to be, the dice saw this great idea, it's the one place in Cleveland where demographically at the time blacks and whites actually lived in the same little quadrant, because Cleveland at the time, I don't know whether it still is, was one of the most racially segregated cities uh, de facto in, in, in the country. It was a river right down the middle, and one people lived on this side and this side, and there were other pockets here. So we were in this little, the idea was we were going to get a church, it was going to get, you know, folks together would be an integrated church. And it was the hardest thing in the world. After that, the, 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 the white folk were all sort of up from Appalachia, and they didn't particularly like black folk. The black folk, folk thought these white folk were just the scum of the earth. I mean, uh, in terms of their view. I mean, it's so funny to have all these different, you don't expect the different kind of class and everything going back and forth in the funny ways they are. So this was a huge challenge. Um, and uh, part of the problem was basically that the gospel, the gospel was being carried into this place through all of our, with all of our cultural baggages. Me, them, whoever, you know. And it, it, this one takes time. This Jacob and Esau is the whole history of, of, of Israel in some way. How does Israel learn that the nations are part of its own life? That the Israel of God actually has Gentiles in it. That takes a long time. And um, people are telling them it that. Paul is telling them that. Other people are telling them that. And when does it actually happen? Um, it sort of happens, but in that, it, that one still hasn't happened yet. Let's say Jew and Gentile are not, yes, uh, now my father's Jewish, but I don't consider myself a Jewish Christian. I'm just a Christian. 
I'm more Gentile in that regard than, than anything <coughs> else, because this isn't this isn't Jew and Gentile. We we, we lost that battle somehow. Well, there was a moment in the early church where it was happening, but it, it didn't quite happen. So. I think that, that the racial thing is sort of part of this larger work that the church is still being challenged to be as the place where the nations are brought together. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, except to say that this is, this is a big picture question, not just a America and so on question that's, that's going to keep, it's, it's, it's going to be holding us together. But here, let me, let me go back. I also think that the issue of black and white uh, in a place like the United States, is tied also to the issue of the church's division. Um, I've heard stuff about why Richard Allen left the, the Methodist Church. Anybody know more about this than I do? You know who I'm talking about, Richard Allen, in, in, the, in the 18th century, who leaves the Methodist Church in Philadelphia and starts the, the um, African church because he wasn't, the story always went that it was because he was, he wasn't allowed, I don't know, they were, they were up in the balcony or something and they weren't, is that right? Or, uh, well, I, I heard this talk, which now I forget all the details about, um, last, it was at the AR, you didn't hear it either, no? <laughs> that, this is by an African American guy, so I don't think he had a particular ax to grind on this particular question of racial things, that that wasn't the reason at all. It was actually had to do with the, the way they were doing prayers. I mean, it was actually a reason that went to ways of worship. Uh, now, there was a lot of racial stuff involved underneath that, but the presenting issue wasn't nearly as clear as people realize. And, and, and so what happened was the church did what it always did. The church actually, you know, you have a fight about the music, and you start another church. And in this case, it was a racially, it was a racially in, informed fight over and, and that ended up Methodism becoming completely segregated until the present uh, in, in some ways. It's fascinating how that happened. Um, and uh, you go to the inner city, it's the same thing. The notion of an integrated church didn't make sense. Why would any black person want to come to my stupid Episcopal church? They already had a nice, interesting church. The music was better there. Uh, it played better. It was much more fun. I mean, uh, it was pathetic why anybody would want to come to an Episcopal church because with this little white guy there and, and uh, uh, trying to be, you know, helpful. And so, I mean, it, but it had, already, it had already established itself. The church had already established itself in its multiple ways that, that, that crossing, even the desire to have some kind of racial reconciliation couldn't get over the, the, the kind of edifices. Uh, uh, I'm not just talking about in terms of buildings, but institutionally that had been put in place. So, there's a, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. There was somebody, no, that was right. Yeah, you're next. Yeah. Um, talking about there the way that the church has already gotten established into certain patterns, you come from like a background that has more of those like denominational ties, but I know a lot of the students that we even come from, ones that don't like, they aren't affiliated, it's just like they're independent church. And how do you start to work toward a recognition of the need for church unity within that background of churches that just do their independent thing. Because I think I'm talking to a lot of students, they start to realize that they want to bring these churches together, but don't want to leave the tradition they've come from at the same time. How do you work towards that? How do you do it? Um, sort of a, a free church understanding of, of what the church is. Yeah, and that's uh, obviously very big in, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, I don't know that there's a how, uh, just as I was saying. I think there's a, there's a challenge. I, I, you know what, I can't answer that. I really don't know. I mean, there's some really compelling reasons for free church, uh, free church ecclesiologies. In some ways, they work better. You get people who are all on the same page, at least initially. Um, um, but, uh, well, no, seriously. And so, you know, there's a lot of excitement when that happens. So starting new churches and so on is something that works really well. It's what, it's the next generation and the one after that. And one of the problems in making a case for this is precisely our 
lack of a historic sen historical sensibilities in this culture. I mean, everything is now. And that's an American thing that goes way back. This isn't just 20th century. I mean, Americans didn't teach history until I don't know when, but uh, um, do they now? <laughs> I don't know. Something like that. But, uh, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, so, so how, do you, how, how does one inculcate a sense that rootedness in time is actually something that's alive with God rather than just, you know, that the past isn't dead? There's no such thing as a dead past in the Christian church, I don't believe, anyway. Um, it's all alive to God. I am the God of the living. I, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's where you have it wrong. And neither do scripture nor the power of God. I am the God of the living. Then he names a bunch of dead people. <laughs> so um, they're not dead. And, and it seems to me one of, the, one of, the, one of the, the challenges of free church ecclesiology is is to understand that to be a Christian is to be part, literally, of something that's much bigger, not just geographically, but temporally speaking. And without that sensibility, it's hard to see, the, it's hard to see what one doesn't have. So the argument is a hard one to make in a, in a, in a, in a culture uh, without, without a past. Um, yeah. Perhaps building off of the last two questions a bit, um, I was listening to a sermon on Moody Radio uh, a week or two ago, and the speaker was saying, he was talking about church unity, um, and at one point started saying, there is no Methodist church, there's no Presbyterian church, there is no black church. Um, and it, I felt like maybe he wasn't giving validity to the cultural differences and the heritage uh, that we've come from. So can you, can you maybe um, talk a little bit about the value um, of tradition um, and of that. Of distinct, of distinct traditions in this case. I mean, inevitably, this is, this is where we are. And when the nations gather around the throne of the Lamb, they are praising God in many tongues. As far as I understand it, they're not singing the same language. They're singing many languages in the same way. So, you know, differences aren't in the kingdom of God, differences don't <coughs> disappear. So there is something special about that. And the question is, how do, you, how, do you, how do people who are different, men and women who are different, and people from one culture, and people from one race, and people from one uh, educational background, and so on, how do, they, how do they live together in a way where they love one another? You know, this sounds so corny, but you know, for who they are, and so on and so forth, it's true. And um, you know, marriage, is, marriage is a great place to learn that. Um, so not everybody should get married. No, that doesn't help. Um, <laughs> um, but you recognize how difficult it is. My point is it's also possible. And I don't know how that happens with churches exactly. My view is that you let people, I was talking this afternoon, that one of the big tests of church unity is whether you let somebody else make decisions for you. Do I let you know, the Catholics make a decision about the Anglican Church? Do I let the Presbyterians make a decision? I mean, do I let somebody into my life enough to make a decision for me from their difference? And I think you know, the issue isn't that you go to a place where everybody no longer has any differences and everybody's equal, but you actually accept and submit to other people's differences. Now, what that means with churches is difficult. I think that. You know, some people claim Catholic uni at churches and so on or attempt to do that. I don't think they've succeeded. Um, but there's some possible truth to that. I mean, now we have a, we have a world of, of, of multiple churches and traditions that have wonderful things in them. Um, you want to throw them away? That's not the point. The point is somehow, that's what the, the, the ecumenism of, what's it called? Um, gift perception or something. There's some new tag for some way to look at this that they're working on in England and Catholics and Anglicans are really Mutual interested. Mutual exchange of gifts. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, um, uh, what's his name? The guy up in Durham, Catholic guy, Paul. Somebody, I'm looking at you as if you should know, but you probably, there's no reason you should know. Um, <laughs> uh, just to make you feel bad. Um, but anyway, the notion that you start by trying to, you start by sharing, sharing precisely those things that you think are wonderful. Now there's something, there is, I said it's corny, there's also something uh, slightly 
And what about the things that are wrong about you? How about sharing those? I mean, a real marriage shares those, not just, you know, you're so beautiful and I, I love the way you, you know, you smile and so on. But um, it's also the way you have a temper. That's partly a way of learning about loving one another. So um, I'm, not, I'm not answering your question because I don't really know how to. This is the problem. Everybody always asks me these practical questions. And I, you know, okay, so it's bad the church is united, divided. Why do this? What are we supposed to do to fix it? I don't know. Um, God, God, God is going to do it. Our, our point is to be in the place where God does it. Um, I, I have no doubt about that. Um, I don't know who that is going to be, and it might be you. Um, this is sort of the Esther moment. Um, might be somebody else too. There's one one more question there. Yeah, thinking um, the question is particularly about your example you used earlier, the delegation from the, the Republic of the Congo. Um, that being oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that being a multi-denominational um, group that came to the U.S. and Canada. Thinking also then about the Russia example, the YMCA and the Orthodox Church and other examples I've, I've come across in Syria where uh, Mennonite friends will put me in touch with Catholics who are ministering with Orthodox in Syria. Um, there, there seems to be this kind of thread that in places of perhaps suffering, uh, there may be a seed or possibility of right. unity in ways that are hard to conceive in other places. And is that kind of thread you've seen? Is that something you could... I, I think that is where unity is happening. I mean, it's happening everywhere. Is Jesus Christ is Lord of the church and he has given himself to us and thus we are one in him. Where we see it, that is where we see it. And those are difficult places. That's why I said these are the places which are in secret in some way. These places where things are so stretched to the breaking point. Uh, now there are a lot of places where there are terrible things happening and Christians haven't done that, as we know. And we don't, we don't know about them because they didn't happen. But there are also a lot of places where they have happened we don't know about it. And you've mentioned some that we do. And what do we learn from that? I think there's a lot to learn from, from it, but we have to know about it and engage in it. Um, I mean, I got a, working in Burundi over several years, I got a little sense of that, which is partly why, you know, when things, uh, I left because I was deported, and it was at the beginning of a huge government um, push against the church, and they were closing church and throwing people out. But it started early. I mean, there were little things that were happening when the, the soldiers would come in and shut something down and so on. And during these things, you, you know, the Catholic would, the, the, the local Catholic priest would come over to you, to you, you the, the, the Anglican or you the friends or, and, and so on, and, and be with you. And you saw that. When things got really rough the first time around, that stopped happening. Um, it was too hard. People were frightened. So. But when you saw that happening, there was, you know, I'm, I'm not a charismatic, uh, not that I don't believe in it, all I do believe it, but that's the closest I've come to, if I can say, the Holy Spirit sort of at work in a way that touches your flesh. Um, 